Greetings, sentient beings. This broadcast is not intended for children. There will be strong language and adult themes. Oh, I, I have to leave then. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, tied to her chair is Jenny. Hi. The ropes are really comfy tonight, Perp. Thank you. Oh, I almost forgot my costume. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm ready. And we have with us Godless Sewing. How's it going? How's it going? I'm editing. My video will be released soon. And I'm making a video about MC Hammer. But before we go off about that, I don't, you know, I don't uh, believe in jinxes or anything, but let me check it real quick. I am at 101 subscribers. Yay. <laughs> okay, file the request for your custom URL before that changes. <laughs> I did. I did because I was like, someone's trolling. Because I got, there was, there's been at least twice where I've been trolled where someone has subscribed five times and then they unsubscribe within like, you know, an hour, hour and a half. Yep. So let's see then tonight in the side chat, we've got uh, Maria Costin. Which is somebody new for our chat. Hi, Maria. Awesome. And Doc Fearson, Jin yeah. Zhu. And uh, that's who we've got for the moment. Who, who, else, who did you say after Doc? Jin Zhu. Oh, hi, Jin. What is wrong with my phone? So, anyway, yes, to, tonight was you know, today, well, Friday would be apple dumpling day. So, you know, as the resident young person who's going to have to take a leave in about 20 minutes, <laughs> um, what constitutes an apple dumpling? I'm from the West Coast. You can trash me if you want. My DMs are open. <laughs> well, the, the basics of it are pretty much, uh, you know, wrapping some apple pie filling in a pastry crust and deep frying it. Is that yeah. a cobbler? No, a cobbler a co is, well, wait a minute, I could be wrong. Uh, isn't a cobbler more like a, um, uh, is, is just like a big lump of, of, of like apple filling, for example, with um, crumb, pie, pie, pie crust crumbles, you know, like on that Dutch yeah. apple pie. Yeah, oh, you're making me hungry. Yeah, just, a, a cobbler is basically a, a big dish of the filling with just the crust on top. Yeah. I love those. <laughs> you know, the, the second you said um, fried, um, it reminded me of the McDonald's apple pies. I have a problem with those. <laughs> oh, I'm addicted to the to those things. They they oh, deep fry God. apple they deep fry apple pies. You, I've been eating them since I was a child. You cannot go wrong with those things. Yeah, well, they, <laughs> they are good. They, they are incredible. Yes. Yeah, so. Oh, it, it's it's one of those. They were, they were two for a buck for a long time. Oh, they yeah. were. Oh, they're starting to bring a lot of that back because people flat out are not going out. And um, I go shopping with my son and my mother at least once a week. It's an adventure. It teaches me why I live alone. <laughs> well, you know, my son was my whole point is um, we go to a greasy spoon place which is semi-expensive, but you get quality old school American like fatty food, pancakes and hamburgers. And our price always comes out to about 37, 38 bucks. Okay. When I take the same Motley crew, <coughs> my, my son and my mother and myself to a place like McDonald's, it costs $47 for three people. Yeah. You can't get out of McDonald's for much under 10 bucks anymore. They have lost their damn mind. Like there is a, a fancy restaurant um, that I go to once a week because I'm trying to support local restaurants, but it's just making me fat. But they are a real like sit down quality steakhouse. And McDonald's, um, if, if you really do the math, McDonald's costs more than that place. Yeah, McDonald's, unless you're, you know, like real careful about only picking on the specials, has gotten pretty expensive. And it's not it, just McDonald's, to, to, to be fair. It, you know, it's, yeah. Harvard, it's Burger King, it's all of them. The, the yeah, most of the fast food places have. And I think the other thing, you know, that during the COVID, when people were stuck at home, a lot of people who didn't normally cook realized they had time to cook. 
so I think some people have realized what decent food tastes like now. Uh, me? So I was one of those shrubs that would literally bribe their child. And, like, Isaiah, every day after school, we'd either go to, like, 7-Eleven. Once a week, I'd take him to McDonald's because it flat out was making me fat. And so I cut it to once a week. But the second COVID hit... Um, I cook three square meals and we're, we're better for it. We'll live longer. <laughs> yeah. Like that's a good thing, you know? <laughs> and, and the funny thing is um, now um, Isaiah will like, I'm obsessed with cauliflower, broccoli and carrots. He eats it with a spoon. Like, <laughs> you know, he loves it, you know? So positive things have happened. From being I locked think, in the house. I think my most favorite vegetable in, or way to prepare vegetable is when um, my mom used to make like a chuck roast and would throw in carrots with it. And the carrots come out with that kind of beefy taste to them. And they're, and they're, they're, they're limp, but they're just so full of, of, of taste. It's just, they're just wonderful. And no, none of my, None of my brothers liked them, so it was just my dad and I that got to eat them. That's how I feel about corned beef, um, about the potatoes, because they absorb the the smell and the taste. I will sit there and eat the whole, all the potatoes before I even attack the corned beef. Oh, good stuff. Good stuff. This is the second week in a row that it's completely um, distracting me from editing, but I needed a break. What, what what's distracting you? Being here is better than me sitting um, in front of a computer screen watching the same thing over and over and over again and trying to catch the moment. I'm going to release a bloopers and you guys are going to laugh your asses off because I'll go from like, hey, this is godless sewing all that was effing stupid. And then, and then it'll click because I, I started it over. Isaiah keeps on telling me, he's like, you got to do a bloopers. <laughs> I, I love bloopers reels. You know, it doesn't matter where it's from. The bloopers are great. <laughs> we all and this and professionals too. You know they they fuck up so good too. It, it's fun to watch. It warmed. It like seriously made me feel better when I got on YouTube. And if you get bored, watch Michael Dorn's um, bloopers on Star Trek: The Next Generation. He curses like a sailor. Wharf is no joke. <laughs> oh, they're great. That would be especially funny in somebody in costume. Because he, he goes yeah. from like a line and he'll go F, 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 F. Cause, and then like, um, you know, Patrick Stewart and everybody's kind of laughing because, you know, there's nothing you can do because he already ruined the shot. <laughs> oh, you should definitely check that out. It's hilarious. Oh, thank you. Thank okay, so you. you've got a little bit of padding now. <laughs> you got a couple extra, so if somebody pulls out, you're still up there. <laughs> I was, thank you. Thank you. Humbly, I thank you. No, because I got trolled hardcore before, so I've learned to like wait a day or two before I say anything. But I That's, hit one. What's that? Nothing. I was just seizuring. Oh. Um. <laughs> Doorknob had saying explosive. Explosive disposal blues bloopers, which is uh, reminding me of that incident that you had there in LA not too long ago, huh? What's that? You you didn't hear about that? That yeah. The, okay, okay. They had confiscated so, the fireworks. So California has been in the news lately, and they're starting to expose that we're all we're all a little put up hard and road. We're all like road wet and put up hard. Who in their right mind? <laughs> and they said today, oh, we, we underestimated the weight of the explosives. They weighed the explosives before they set them off. Shouldn't somebody know that? Shouldn't there be a professional there? And instead of taking it 20 feet out to the main road, where it's mainly, hey, sweet, how's it going? Hey, Irish. The, hey, LAP, sweet. the LAPD, has they messed up so bad. They injured people destroyed people's homes. Um, there's people that are still displaced because of it. Yeah, you know? I I can't uh, understand why they did it there instead of, you know, taking it to 
a more isolated area or, you know, for wh like some they, abandoned military base that you've got plenty of out there. Why do they do it at all? They're just fireworks, you know? They're, they're cowboys. In L.A., they're cowboys. They want to show off. They want to be on TV. It's it's all for show. Yeah, they wanted to make a public show of it. Well, Our high... Yeehaw right. for them. <laughs> Our high speed chases are shown in like Arizona. My um my cousin's wife will call me and she's like, Are you watching this uh this high speed chase? And I'm like, You live in the middle of Arizona. What are you what are you talking about? It's big business here. It is it is interesting how many high speed chases they get and then get on camera, of course. Um, compared to anywhere else. I mean, I, li I lived in Milwaukee, and you know, Milwaukee certainly does not compare with LA in size, but, but it is a, a metropolitan area. Um, you know, the whole county and surrounding places, of a million and a half at least, maybe, maybe two. Um, and that would like almost never happen. <laughs> it's, um, and it happens, seems to happen all the time, every day, damn near. In LA, it's um, you know it's really funny. Yeah. Uh, it's one of those things that because the economy has gone down, it seems like it's literally every six hours. Because I live next to um, a major freeway, like anyone in LA, but I hear choppers every night now. And when I say choppers, I mean the hell the the news choppers and the fleet of choppers that our sheriffs have. Don't they call those ghetto birds? Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, a, Swede, you're kind of far from your mic. You're sounding real quiet there. I'm, a, I'm offended. You can up and pay attention. <laughs> my teacher. Did, did you no, say you just got to bring your mic close to your chair? That's all. <laughs> did you say ghetto bird birds? Oh, um, Ice Cube wrote a song about it. A very famous song. Run, run, run from the ghetto bird, because they're always over um, South LA. Oh. The you could you could see them on the freeway, and you could say, "Okay, they're in that neighborhood. They're in that neighborhood." It I, still I've, goes on. I've never I've never heard that term. I guess yeah. I my roommate in college was from Watts, so. Oh, that's awesome! Oh, that's awesome! I got I, one, I got one hell of an education. <laughs> um, you know, little ignorant, dumb, stupid white kid from central from central Iowa or eastern Nebraska goes to college, shows up to a, a second generation Argentinian immigrant from Venice Beach as one roommate, and the other um, a, a military kid who's ended up uh, living in Watts with his parents. Oh wow! Uh, and uh, yeah, that was one hell of an education. Watts is seriously no joke. Growing up in the suburbs, I had no idea what the difference was. You walk into like a Taco Bell, okay, in South LA, it's like a bank. Every everything is through glass. You do not touch the employees. Everything is through bulletproof glass, like it would be at a bank. Really. And this was 25 years ago, almost 30 years ago, the first time I walked into a South L.A. Um, convenience store or, or any kind of fast food. Now, is that because of corporate paranoia? No, <laughs> the drug war fucked that area up bad. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and the FBI, CIA, that whole conspiracy that was a real conspiracy to flood the streets of minority communities with drugs worked in South LA. And what happened was, is it created an environment in which you got the Crips and the Bloods and now MS-13 and a whole bunch of others because people <laughs> tend to stick together when, you know, or, or look for groups to belong to. And MS, MS is kind of unprecedented though, because they showed up and, you know, we had gangsters here in, in Los Angeles, some of the hard, most hardcore people. And then people came from El Salvador. They came from a civil war. Yeah. And they laughed at the LA gangsters and they took over within like four or five years because they had no scruples whatsoever. And Americans, like, regardless of what you want to think, we're conditioned to stop at a certain point. We, an, an American, you know, we're, we're just, you know, I don't know. We, we weren't well, raised yeah, in warfare. It's like the old La Cosa Nostra where, you know, women and children were off limits. Yeah, exactly. 
Exactly. And, and then the new gangsters came in and suddenly they weren't off limits and everybody no kind of went, Ooh. Yeah. They're no joke. Uh, and it, yeah. It's LA is a crazy place. And but even- it's, it's definitely not corporate paranoia, but it's also not like a cultural thing. And it's also not a, because of their skin color thing. It's because the government tried to fuck them over as far as a, 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 an entire community is concerned. And the remnants. Oh, I'm about to say the remnants of it. Look at Oakland. Look at East Oakland right now. That was the heart of the Black Panther. Um, that's literally where the Black Panthers came from. Um, how many years later? It is one of the worst neighborhoods on earth, and you know it's still flooded with drugs and guns there. Well, Compton. Compton is the end game. Compton is being <laughs> gentrified. To the point where black black uh, communities can't even afford to live there anymore because don't even know, they get drive me started. Don't even get me started. Okay, well, I'm Venice, gonna say Venice Beach is also being gentrified to all hell too. So I'm biased for Hollywood as someone who's LGBTQIA plus. Hollywood was the most gay, steamy place on planet Earth. They had. Um, Booths where you could go in and watch movies on every corner in old Hollywood. I mean, all the way to downtown. It was catered for CD people. <coughs> Hollywood had adult stores everywhere, and gentrification ruined it. Well, it, it, was, well, it was like the old Times Square. The old Times Square was nothing but nudie, sh- nudie shows. Yep. Exactly. Downtown San Francisco was the same way, and they're doing the same thing with downtown yep. San Francisco. Downtown Minneapolis, they did the same thing about 15 years ago, was that they destroyed what they called Block E, you know, which was an entire block in the middle of downtown because it had too many adult bookstores concentrated in one area. And they took that out, and they built basically what was more or less a small shopping mall right in the center of the city. And this was their big plan to revitalize the city and boost the economy. And it has done neither. My whole yeah, yeah, businesses yeah, yeah. were doing a lot more when they were selling, selling girly books. You know, yeah, they, I'm, I'm guessing that the, before that too, that was probably a safe haven for a lot of people that were members of the alphabet mafia that's what I was just about to go off about with Hollywood, where now, like, and, and you know what? I'm saying this, and if you're in the L.A. area, in just in Hollywood, there are three major LGBTQIA plus centers. So you're not alone. They're literally on one on Schrodinger, one on Wilcox, and then there's another one on Santa Monica Boulevard. Well, fortunately, <laughs> in Minneapolis, somehow, um, the gay 90s which is like the best known gay bar in the city, managed to escape that and is still operating. Well, yeah, I was, I was to the gay 90s and um, early 80s. Oh, yeah, they used to have a great drag show there. But yeah, now now you go to like Times Square. Now you have to go to the fashion district to get any LGBTQ um, exposure to like clubs and anything like that um, because the fashion district is where uh, attracts that type of, of activity and that because that's where all the clubs are that stay open till four in the morning mm-hmm. and you get runway shows, not drag shows, but actual like fashion runway shows in the bar. Like they'll just barge in, <laughs> throw a runway down and, and some Russian designer will be like, I hope there's a buyer here. Um, but what, but what it's turned into is just a, whoever you are, no one cares. No one asks. It's a safe haven now for that area. And it's probably one of the safest places to walk around at night right now in New York City. I thought, you know, um, Las Vegas is like that too. They have, um, I'm like giving, I'm like giving directions over by by, uh, the Hard Rock in in Las Vegas. They have a whole um, LGBTQIA area. I mean, they have their own hotels. They, like I haven't stayed there and act like a a complete whore in the hallway. There's (laughs) hotels there. There's more than one bar, literally more than one, like four or five. There's a punk rock bar. It's it's a really cool side of town. Yeah, there is still a whole thing around the gay 90s. You know, within a couple of blocks of it, there's a, a gay health club. 
And there's this old hotel with these tiny rooms. You can barely close the door without hitting the bed, you know, <laughs> but it, it's still operating as a cheap hotel for, you know, people who can't find any place else to rent. You just reminded me of something. There are still bathhouses in San Francisco, though. Oh, yeah. I, I check every once in a while. <laughs> but the gay 90s has always been a good center for that because, you know, they they have just, you know, welcomed everyone. It's been a mix of, there's, you know, there's, gays, lesbians, cross-dressers, transsexuals. There's, awesome. there's an entire neighborhood in Milwaukee that was um, um, gentrified, not just gentrified, but gentrified by the um, LBGT. Q um, um, people, and the, it was Br Brady Street South. Everything south of Brady Street, um, which used to be a hippie uh, bastion um, back in the sixties and seventies, and but it had really a lot of really nice properties. You know, stuff that was built in the late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds, and they took it from its just completely dilapidated state. Um, which is why all the hippies would move there because rent was so cheap, <laughs> and and you know renovated all these properties and just turned it. It's just fucking beautiful now, um, and it's a, it's very heavily owner occupied, and you know. So I I don't know how it is this now, is cool. but Portland, Oregon was like that twenty years ago when I lived there. They had one specific side of town, and it was like drag shows, but it was just well oh. Oh well, like they let me walk in there like this. No one judged me, and I have not deviated the way I dress. <laughs> I like what Doornam had here. I didn't know this. That Elvira learned to do her fashion makeup from drag queens, and when oh. one of the regulars didn't show up, she actually did the drag show. <laughs> Elvira was like my first, you know, the first where you're like, holy cow. And she is still hot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah, her whole thing, she was just dripping with sexuality. She was on um, the Count show. It, it's on the History Channel. He, It's called Counting Cars. And this was years ago, but she got a car made. And she's, you know, older, but she still is just so well put together. Yeah, and it's something I still don't quite get, but I know it's a regular thing. That gay men are fascinated by big boobs, just as much as straight men. Well, that that's DNA. We're, we're, I was about to say <laughs> that, that that's <laughs> that, that's three million years of evolution. Why are men attracted to pregnant women and not necessarily attracted, but like, um, if I see a pregnant woman, I'm like leaping to open the door. I'm like, oh, you know, have a good day, you know. Evolution. Because uh, we're, we're, <laughs> we are conditioned genetically to care for the next generation exactly. that carries our DNA. Um, okay, good night, doorknob. So, so, door you guys, so you guys are good for something, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, I mean... The, the I have way the more maternal, maternal instinct than any of the women I've dated. Thank you. I just didn't want to say it out loud in case my ex-wife is watching. We're still cool. Actually, yeah. That, well, this is why I wound up raising nine kids that weren't mine. Every one of those relationships pretty much started because the kids got attached to me, so the woman felt she should keep me around. So, yeah. <coughs> That's not healthy, but it's... Yeah, well, my ex used to call me the Pied Piper because it's like when I was in the store, if anybody wasn't watching the kid, somehow they came right to me. <laughs> you know, yeah. so I, I'd be standing there and this kid will come up and start talking to me and I'm like, I'm going to get in trouble for this. Where's your parents? <laughs> Jenna, are you going to help me with my charity stream? Please say yes. I'm going to need people to keep me awake. Oh, charity? What What are you raising money for? <laughs> the John Ritter Foundation for Aortic Health. Oh, awesome. September, September 19th is Aortic Dissection Awareness Day. So I'm going to September 18th through the 19th from 5 p.m. to 5 p.m. Try and go 24 hours to raise about $5,000 for the foundation because that foundation, here, here's my plug for them, they pay 
for families, kids to go through screening and genetic testing. Like that's, oh, that's, awesome. that's five to 10,000 bucks a kid that they pick up for anyone that requests it. No wow. questions asked. That's impressive. Yeah, I, I, I'm willing to remember, I don't, I don't produce kind of content. I don't have equipment or anything, but I'd certainly be uh, happy to, to guest on. So anytime anybody wants to come in, pop on, either when I'm playing a game or whether I'm just sitting there talking, going to, you know, things that are going on. Um, some of it, obviously, I might just be staring off into space because I'm tired. Uh, Can I go off about how Jack Tripper raised me? And um, one day I will build the Regal Beagle in this garage or whatever <laughs> other garage I move to. <laughs> come and knock on our door. <laughs> Oh, sweet. Absolutely. Just, just drop a link in my uh, Twitter DMs. All right. <laughs> That's this yeah. weekend. That's, uh, yeah, it's this weekend. Okay, well, so when are you going to be starting? What's up? What, what time will you be starting that? 5 p.m. Saturday to 5 p.m. Sunday. Wow. I'm going to be super um, okay. alone this weekend. <laughs> I know I've got something scheduled, but yeah, I'll definitely be Whenever able to come in for some time in, in there. Yeah, if it's five minutes, if it's 15 minutes, if you just want to pop in and say hi or or share it with people you know. so Yeah, I mean, well, when you put a link out, I'll definitely share it around on Twitter. It's, totally. It is already on Twitter, I think. I shared, yeah, I put out a couple tweets today with the link to the Twitch. Um. But yeah, I'll I won't put out a StreamYard link until Saturday morning. Awesome. Now I totally but have a, do you have a, a YouTube link for it. Uh I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna try to dual cast to YouTube and Twitch. Uh, we'll see if it works. Okay. Yeah, you know, if you wanna drop any links here in the side chat, go right ahead. So yeah. I'll probably do that later. I don't need to do that right now. This is your stream. I should shut up. <clears throat> oh, no, that's fine. I've got no problem with anybody plugging a good cause. So, but yeah, no, they um, they literally paid for Anders and Stig's screening and genetic testing. And that was $18,000 worth of medical costs that we didn't have to worry about. Yeah, and... You know, it's ridiculous in this country that, you know, being able to afford medical attention depends on, you know, what you can pay. Yeah. That's just wrong. Um, it should be available to everybody who needs it, regardless of how much money they've got. And it's sad that we had to lose an actor and comedian like him to be able to have that sort of charity even here. Absolutely. So. He was uh, one hell of a guy, uh, an outspoken atheist from what Neil has told me. Really? Yep. Wow. Um, he grew up the son of a country singer, I believe, Tex Ritter. That he, I didn't know that. I know all about Tex Ritter. Um, I didn't know that either. Yep. And Small world. I believe his parents were kind of just cultural Protestants and John was just kind of like, yeah, I'm not even that. <laughs> um, so, and then a couple of weeks ago, there was a special on ABC about his life uh, and on his unfortunate death. Um, so yeah, it's the other thing is, is obviously with AD awareness day is, is John is the perfect example of, being misdiagnosed when the event is happening because they kept telling him he was having a heart attack. And because they misdiagnosed him like that, he died. They, he was going through a dissection for 48 straight hours. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. And they just kept telling him, no, you're just having a heart attack and it's not bad enough for us to do any intervention on. Um, and so he just bled to death. Okay, I remember oh. there being, you know, some controversy around his death, but I never understood what was happening there. Yeah, Same. it was just something that was so so. It happened so sudden, you know. Yeah, I was under the impression that it hit him and he just dropped. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I started reading about it, and he was he was on set when the initial dissection happened. And he went home and then went to the hospital pretty much right after that. And for 48 hours, they just, they screwed the pooch. And it, it mirrors exactly what they were telling me in the hospital. They're like, we're, there, there's a hormone that you expel when you have a heart attack and we're trying to get the trend line for it. And so I was just sitting there giving blood and they were like, well, you're not having a heart attack. We don't know what's going on until I just offhand mentioned that I had been tested for Marfan back in the day and they went, Oh shit. And then all of a sudden the CT and the sonogram test are <laughs> going off. Um, because Marfan is, you know, basically if, if somebody says that it's whenever they go in the hospital, they have to get a CT. It's just required. I was about to ask you what Marfan was. And Marfan is a connective tissue disorder. <laughs> and since your aorta is a made of connective tissues, mm -hmm. um, it's the inability for your FBN1 gene to produce what's called fibrillum, which makes your connective tissues elastic. And if it can't be elastic, guess what it becomes? Right. Little. Yep. And so over time, um, if you have Marfan, you'll get a, a, a large aneurysm. My youngest son, Stig, has the aneurysm already developing. My oldest did not have the gene, so that's good. Well, you know. 50 50 shot and now i have oh, wow. a 50 50 uh 50 50 uh, problem to deal with but um but yeah and when stig's about 22 to 25 he'll have to have his valve replaced but it won't be uh you know an emergent condition when that happens it'll be planned and uh, all that good stuff but you know he's he just when when we found that out he can't play football or basketball or anything like that anymore you know in high school mm -hmm. Um, okay, can you uh, can you type it in the side chat there? I'm not even gonna try to spell it, but you know, just so I can add that to the description here. Jerome. Um, and yeah. uh, you might on Twitter maybe uh, you know drop a note to uh, to student Dr. Ben. Yep, See if he knows anything about he it. Will, he will definitely be there. He says he's going to try to get a few of his compatriots to tap in, too. Okay. Uh, because um, as Jeannie Fuhr will tell you, I'm kind of a medical miracle. Yep. Um, yeah, people don't survive survive aortic dissections. <laughs> it's, it's very they just don't. <laughs> well, it's sounding like most of the time they just don't get diagnosed until they're dead. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. yeah the, the, the problem for most people is 80% of them never even make it to the hospital. They die before they get there. 80% of those that get to the hospital get misdiagnosed, don't, or it takes too long to diagnose, or, or it just happens so fast when they get there that they're what, dead. What, what it is, folks, is you know your, your aorta, which is the, the gigantic vessel that comes out of the heart that delivers everything to the body um it, it's it's fucking big it's like an inch <laughs> in diameter <laughs> it really flows with all the blood in the body um it's it's like all blood vessels it has multiple walls that do you know various things in, in the three of them behavior of, of, of the, the part and they kind of like peel apart and they bleed in, 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 into the area between them, um, eventually causing enough of the blood vessel wall to close off the flow um, and because it's bleeding into this cavity between, between the layers. And eventually there's not enough blood flow and you fucking die. You know, plus there's the blood loss too. Yeah. Um, so it's it's just, and there's really no symptomology of it happening in most people that it just that it just occurs, and um, they they drop dead. They might feel uncomfortable, but they may not reach uncomfortable to a point that saying, "Oh well, something's wrong." Yeah, they just you're gone. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you survive the initial onslaught of the initial tear of the inner lining, um, which is usually a very very painful event, but it goes away really quickly. Uh, the the long term onset, and when I say long term, I mean the next few hours are you puking your guts up, and this is kind of a 
telltale sign, but the telltale sign that I, that I didn't have that I should have was back pain. And what it's what they call transient back pain and where it, it moves because the dissection is going down your aorta. Like mine went all the way down to my leg. Gee. So, <laughs> my mine is in the middle of my thigh is the ending point. Um, How do they stent something like that? Uh, the Dacon, the, the Dracon graft goes down the vast majority of my aorta. And then they just, um, uh, sew it together after that and, um, uh, manage your blood pressure. So you don't, uh, reopen it. Fuck. I, I just can't imagine that. That's incredible. Yeah. I, my, have, uh, I have one other friend who, um, uh, went, went through that and she is 24 and in excellent health and um it it just happened you know mm -hmm. and it, it's like a total shock when is somebody that young and, and in good shape and it's like how does that happen she's canadian so she didn't have to pay a dime um, yeah i can tell you that my uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollar uh, surgery and stay in the hospital was was worth it but um you know we're, we're just lucky that insurance was basically yeah. paid for all of it um, really well yeah. I, I expect you know that it's something most people haven't heard of so like you say even when it's happening at best most people think they're having a heart attack yeah thirteen thousand people a year die in the united states from it so it's not something i mean thirteen thousand is a lot of people that die from it but as far as like, you know, heart disease and all the other things that can happen yeah. that kill you, it's it's a much smaller number. The, the yeah. thing with screening and everything is, is it catches the, the screening that the Ritter Foundation and everything does catches the whole host of um, uh, connective tissue disorders. There's 27 of them. And the screening will catch everything. So it's not just dissections. It's the entire health of your heart. It's the entire health of your joints. Um, anything to do with connective tissue, uh, your eyes. So your lenses in your eyes are held together and in place with connective tissue. And things with like Marfan or Ehlers-Danlau uh, will cause the connective tissue in your eyes to degrade to the point where your lenses will just one day fall out. I wonder. I wonder if there's any relationship with... Um, that whole scenario and uh, lupus, lupus being a disease with the connective tissues as well. Um, no, uh, so far I have not heard that. Um, but again, I don't know everything and who knows. Um, oh man, my hypochondria is kicking in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so like, oh, so like my youngest son, you know, he's only three, but he has to go to a full on eye doctor every year to get his, um, connective tissue and his eyes tested. So do I, mm -hmm. um, it can also cause you to have with a condition called AMPI, which is acute posterior multifocal placoid pigment epitheliopathy. What that means is your ret your in your retina, your blood vessels swell because uh. connective tissues start to be attacked, and then your body like tries to fight itself when it's attacking it. So it's a really messed up thing that happens in your eyes. Well, for the majority of us, because this happened to me, the doctors don't draw the conclusion of AMPI with uh, connective tissue disorder. And so it's it's their awareness campaign of talking with doctors and making sure that you know an optometrist can talk to their patient to go to their PCP primary care provider about and with questions to ask because there's only one person in this world that will be your advocate in the medical system that's you oh absolutely <laughs> that's, yeah. that's how I feel about my my son's education like. If I didn't speak up, he wouldn't um, be in half the classes he's in or have half the care that he has. And you know, with with well, and it was like you know they kept trying to be like you know you just had a minor heart attack, we're going to send you home. And I'm when I was in the hospital, I was like, the fuck you are. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm puking everywhere. I feel like hell. My chest feels like it's being you know compressed with a vice. You know, you're not sending me home. The guy reluctantly admitted me um, to the hospital. 
uh-huh. out of the ER. So, I mean, it was it was a comedy of errors up until the one doctor overheard me say Marfan. Um, yeah, when my fiance died, she was in the process of setting up a nonprofit to provide medical advocates for people because she was so fed up with doctors who weren't listening and were ignoring half her symptoms. Mm-hmm. That that's like when I had my heart attack. Um, I had no I had no heart pain. I had no pain down the arms. None of the traditional symptoms. I had nothing in the back. You know, shoulders, nothing. And um, so I go into the hospital, and I thought, you know, myself, I thought, well, this is gallbladder because the only pain I was having was right by gallbladder, and I know that familial sensitivity to, to gallbladder stuff and yeah so i'm figuring that's what's going on and it just started hurting so fucking bad on super bowl sunday february 8th 19 whatever year it was 2008 i think february 12th doesn't matter um and i go to the er and it, it all started with the per- people at the front desk in triage they're they they look at me and give me this, you know, it was two in the morning. I drove myself there through a blizzard, a literal blizzard. Oh. A foot and a half of snow came down that night. And, um, and I looked like hell. I just absolutely looked like hell. And they looked at me and I could tell, just feel from the, from the look in their eyes that, oh, this is, this is somebody seeking drugs. Because my primary pain, complaint was intense pain. Yeah. Um, and so they kind of ignored me and then they put me to the side and then uh, did a couple of minor, you know, blood pressure and this and that little, little test and, and, oh, let's, let's get a CBC and, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and then just put me on a gurney and stuffed me in the back of the ER. Um, and I was, God, I was sitting there for like an hour or so. And finally some, some intern comes along and uh, picks up my chart and, and is reading and stuff and looking at me and, you know, does a couple, you know, uh, touch testing things that doctors do and um, just gets this gigantic look, big eye look at me and rushes out of the room. And suddenly the whole room was filled with other doctors and shit. And they, they you know, didn't say right away because they don't want to panic you. But it was pretty clear that they realized yeah. something really bad was going on. <laughs> and it was, you know, it was a heart attack. A triple, I needed a triple bypass. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and like you say, you're just shoved off to the side and ignored for an hour. Yeah. So, I'm going to completely sidetrack this really quick because I know you're listening, Apple, right now. In your editing <laughs> software that I paid way too much money for, the cursor disappears every time I do another task. You might want to fix that. Besides that, it's an excellent machine, but it's annoying when I'm editing and the cursor disappears. I know you're listening. You bought Final Cut? Maybe. <laughs> okay. And when I when I figure it out, I'm gonna beam myself. It's gonna be awesome. When I figure it out, <laughs> I have to take a class on it. <laughs> Since we're off topic, I'll make a couple of channel announcements here. Uh, first of all, I I wound up taking COVID test. It came back negative, like I expected. Just so people don't worry. So yeah, I've just. I've got another sinus infection, which is not uncommon for me. And this one feels like it might hang around for a couple of weeks, but there's nothing to worry about. Do you have a lower immune system? Because I do and everything makes me sick. No, normally it's pretty good. It's just uh, I get sinus infections and strep throat. Same. I, You know, I kind of laugh because I was already kind of Howard Hughes, Howie Mandel before COVID hit. <laughs> But I'm and, uh, extra hiding in the house nowadays. Well, and another thing that, you know, I was kind of waiting. We've got got a dozen people here now, so I was waiting until the audience gathered more. Um, but, you know, I, I think everybody's aware I have perpetual sleep issues. So I got referred to a sleep psychologist to try and attack this from a new angle. And uh, so far, it's like all things that I know I've tried before. But, you know, kind of trying things in a new combination, see if anything works. But because of this, I'm going to have to move my night streams uh, forward about two hours starting next week. So we'll start at Thursdays at 10 p.m. 
just so I don't wind up, you know, being up till four or five o'clock in the morning. Well, that works because it's the school year, so I can't stay up all night either. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that you're supposed to be able to give to your art, you know, and if you're not willing to destroy your sleep. <laughs> you know, but I have fine. no sleep to destroy yet. Let me get some sleep and then we can destroy it. Oh, that's, that's, that's one thing that I underestimated when the uh, cardiothoracic surgeon looked at me and said, all right, here's the thing about a mechanical valve. It ticks. I'm like, I, okay, I whatever. I don't care. Just give me a, just give me a valve that, that I don't ever have to see you again with. And he said, all right, fucking hell. I cannot sleep when it's quiet because it ticks yeah. so loud. I heard you talking about that Neil stream earlier tonight. Jeez. You know, and I, yeah, that must be infuriating to have that be something that's keeping you alive. You know, and that that's why yeah. I always have like YouTube playlists going all night long while I sleep because I need familiar voices to mask out any background noise. Mm -hmm. Same. I do the same thing. I fall asleep to a bunch of British shows. Um, there's this one thing I'm subscribed to where it's all um, starship noises. Yeah, where I, there's been times where I will just you know sit there like I'm not getting up. Yeah, you know? there's the oh. uh, there's the ten hour night shift on the Enterprise. Um, oh, I I need something new. That's uh, <laughs> that's on YouTube. Just just look for like ten hour uh, night shift Enterprise. Awesome. I I awesome. think that's the same. Group and it's just you. the background noise of the bridge of the Enterprise. Oh, I'll pass out. That'll put me out because <laughs> I I watched um the the next generation because there's certain episodes where it's you know very melodic throughout the entire episode that sounds yeah. kind of cool i'll have to look that one up the, the group I, the, uh, stuff they have 10 hour things and um they do a lot of starship noises um but i i'm partial to the uh thunder th thunderstorms yeah mm. well i like playing a lot of the live streams but there's some of them i can't like I can't I'll, put Neil's on just because at the beginning and the end the music comes on a bit too loud. You know what's really funny? Um, I used I can fall asleep to rain because I lived in Portland, Oregon in my twenties. <laughs> so it'll just remind me of when I I lived in Oregon. I was not used to it. It was culture shock at first. Hey Isaiah. Oh well, you came from the desert. Of course, it would be. <laughs> But if I if, if I had to tell you what it was like to live with the the, the valve in your heart, um, go take a metronome, jam it in your ear, uh -huh. and then turn it on. <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I was just thinking of you know like the old wind up alarm clocks, and you know it's like somebody tried to give me one of those, and I was like, yeah, fucking hell, you want me to never sleep again? <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to tell you, does, does any of that stuff work? Like, or is it all placebo? Like, to help you sleep, at least. Is it, does it actually work? What? Like, I, I'm, I'm asking Purple, like, that stuff they're recommending, does it, because I have, well, I have sleep problems, like, like, major it's a very, sleep. <laughs> it's a bunch of different things that's on an individual basis. Most of it helps a lot of people. You know, I just haven't found anything that's real effective at helping me. So, like I say, we're going to try kind of a combination of different things of, you know, I mean, of course, they start out with this three-page thing on sleep hygiene about how you're supposed to keep your bedroom. And it's like, yeah, that's the way I've been sleeping for the last 12 years. Hasn't helped. And, you sweet, I, I couldn't imagine um, hearing your own heartbeat. Because there's a drug that I won't say <laughs> that, like, if you did it and you laid down, you'd hear your own heartbeat, you know? Yeah, and I, I, couldn't, I, I get it. I, I can't imagine, imagine it with a mechanical tick, but that, oh. you know, that is one of the things for me that, you know, I'll lay there in bed and I'll just become too aware of my own body, you know, that I'll, I'll be feeling the rhythm of my own pulse. And it's like, yeah, this isn't helping. I will lay down at 3 30 in the morning, close my eyes, and, and, in my head, I'm like, did I lock the gate eight hours ago? Did I like shut the door to the shop? I, you know, did I call this person? Like, it's it's a terrible habit. 
Yep. And maybe Jennifer can confirm this, but if you have your heart operated on, especially to the extent that I did, you lose your what's called the periocardial sac, mm -hmm. which is the f thing that surrounds your heart that cushions mm -hmm. your heart. Oh. So they can't repair that. So you just lose it. So if you lay wrong, it thumps into your sternum. No, oh, I, I do not. I do not um, experience that at all. I, I never. Well, I never lay on my stomach. I, I just can't breathe if I do. Oh that. no, this is if you lay on your side wrong, or if you, if even if you're like on your back inclined weird. It, it the way your heart re will reposition. Yeah, it'll no. square into your chest. No, n never had that. I always sleep on my left side. Always, and it, I'm I've trained myself that way because I used to have really bad. Um, uh, what what do they call that stomach thing? Um, I have to have a fan like Doc Fearsome. I have to have a fan on, and I don't know if I have RLS. Um, actually, a friend of mine keeps on telling me that I do, but I roll around so much in my sleep. It's like um, I'm like an alligator, so I sleep alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's 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 awful. But when I wake up, I'm refreshed. But I'm I'm never in the same position. And I'm always like cl I'm clear on the other side of the bed. I do run an air cleaner right by my bed, both for the noise and also to you know hopefully keep some of the allergens down. I I need to have moving air at night. Absolutely. There are what, some people that air they, for a lot. That I just have to have moving air across my body. Yep. There are some people that if you have to have moving air directed at you rather than just the noise, it can be a sign of sleep apnea. Oh, don't tell me that. I mean, I well, I have to have the fan like uh, pointing at me. I'm wearing a sweatshirt. It could be all like 90 degrees at night. I'm wearing a sweatshirt with a fan on. Like, I, there's a whole ritual. Because it creates <laughs> enough air pressure where uh, it helps you continue to breathe, but it's never enough to actually like. Every, the issue. every one of my doctors says that I probably have sleep apnea, but I can't afford the studies um, or the, the machine because I yeah. it's just not covered by any of my insurance, and I can't afford that shit. Yeah. Um, not covered by your insurance? Nope. I did have one of the sleep studies covered by the Minnesota Medicaid years ago. Hmm. Well, so, you know, um, they, they don't send your doctor. doctor. Well, ask your doctor to look into it that, you know, maybe with the right referral, because sometimes it is a question just of how the doctor writes the referral. Yeah. And sleep apnea is incredibly hard on your heart. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My. Um... So if you think you have it there, uh, Will, go get tested. You yeah. know what? I, I, I'm a bad breather. I already have heart issues. <laughs> I'm a born bad breather. So like, I, yeah. you know, from the jump, I have heart issues. And for someone my size, I have heart issues of someone that's like double or triple my size. Well, and the, the thing was, is like I had apnea, but what solved it was the fact that my, my reflux got solved because mm. my stomach acid would come up and I would choke on it. Yeah, so I was just saying in the side chat, too, that I have the acid reflux and finally have the medication controlling that. Yeah. So yeah. I, I would have that a lot, that I would burp in my sleep and I would feel the acid burn my throat. Yep. Yeah, that, that's the thing that made me sleep on my left side. That's um, that, that fucked my teeth up, too. Um, mm -hmm. Something fierce because, you yeah. know, that acid just eats away at your oh, teeth. Yeah, oh, yeah I'm yeah. completely out of teeth now, and that was part of it. A friend of mine came down with esophageal cancer, um, and they blamed the acid reflux for it. Yeah, well, yeah, because your you, your body has to continually replace those cells, and every time a cell reproduces, you know that that is one of the cancers my father had. I don't know whether or not he had the acid reflux. That is not a big enough coffee mug, Will. <laughs> <laughs> That's a party platter for coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, I when it yeah, comes I, to, I looked when it comes to coffee, coffee, I do oh, not. Geez. It's the size of my face. This <laughs> is half a pot of coffee. I don't want to walk back and forth. 
I have to edit tonight. I do not mess around, says the guy with heart issues. Drinking doesn't, coffee late at night. Doesn't it get cold by the time you get to the bottom? I'm from California. I prefer my coffee cold. <laughs> well, he also doesn't have the problem of the air dropping below 70 degrees. So I'm not a coffee snob. I will, um, I'll drink it. I, you know, I like it when it's warm. Like when I first wake up, it's my ritual. When I wake up, you know, I become human again. I'm not, you know, <laughs> but during the day, I drink it all day. So it's. It's one of those I learned, weird things. I learned this happy, happy thing this this summer. Um, I I can't believe it took this long to learn it. Um, if I if I have a coffee in the morning and I'm going somewhere in my car, uh, and it's going to be one of those sweltering kind of days, uh, if I get to sleep like halfway through the coffee or something before I have to get out of the car, if I just leave it in the car in the cup holder, it stays warm all day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's total. Um, here, here in Cali, if you have any hot beverage and you just leave it in your cup holder, it will stay just as hot. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> well, right now we're in what I always consider the sweet spot that hits us in the spring and the fall. That period of just maybe about two months between when the chocolate's going to melt in the car and when my pop is going to freeze. I just saw what Mage Grey Wolf said. Like, I I would love to put a Fitbit on and see how much I move around in my sleep. I would love that. I didn't realize how embarrassing it was until an ex girlfriend of mine, um, she got her phone out and she taped me to shame me because <laughs> I was in denial. Because I was, you know, you can deny stuff you do in your sleep. I was like, no, I don't. Yeah, I, I haven't seen it. <laughs> I really wish I could get you know one of those monitors they have. You know that actually you know, checks your brain activity while you're sleeping to see the different stages. I you know, it's um, one of my things is that I sleep in such short cycles, I usually don't get down to the deeper stages. So I have a weird question. Do you guys dream? Yes. Um, I yeah, have intensive, I have, in, I, I dream in color. There's all the cast of characters, which dreaming literally are neurons in your brain. Look it up. There is a portion of your brain that is made for dreaming. So it's not woo-woo. We all dream on purpose. It's evolution. But anyways, yeah. um, I think that's part of my moving around is because like I'm interacting in my dreams. I'm walking around. It's it's oh, yeah. it's the strangest thing. It's the because I <laughs> wake up and I feel myself like have I've like I've moved around, you know. Yeah, there's um you can also Fitbits will also um help you recognize how long you're in each stage of sleep um oh is it able like to that. tell that more than yep. just when you're asleep and when you're awake based on um your pulse your breathing patterns it can it can have a really really good guess at which stage you're in hmm. wow okay wow. i should look into that i don't even know how much of this wrong so Perp, you, you can I you, we you and I can talk some other time if if it would help you. Well, yeah, anything that would help me sleep better because that's just you know pretty much all my other issues are aggravated by the fact that I you know I'll lay in bed for eight hours to get three hours sleep. Yeah, and I've I've had that problem before, but you know obviously with the reflux that helps, but it's you know anything that can like tell you some people sleep six hours and that's all they'll ever sleep like at night. Mm. Um, well, you know, and if I can get five or six hours solid without waking up in the middle, that's fantastic. Yeah. You know, I could go indefinitely if I could get that on a regular basis. See, about six and a half is what I get. And, and I feel refreshed. Uh, humans but, are actually a weird creature in that we prefer to have our sleep broken up into two parts. Typically, like when we were in the 1800s, you would wake up at three o'clock in the morning, have some family time, have a drink of water. You know, some of the family may go outside to take a whiz, um, but you'd all come back in and you'd, you'd sit around for like a half hour and then you'd all go back to bed. Um, I, would, 
I am literally, if you wake me up, I am spitting fire and curse words. <laughs> Beware. <laughs> Beware. I rarely get sleep. But so when I do. <laughs> well, typically, typically within three to four hours after your initial sleep, um, you'll, you'll, you will wake up. You're just, you just won't know that you're like almost out of sleep. Like you go. Yeah. That's so, like, well, well, see, that's the problem time. that most people cycle through, but they don't like come fully awake in between. That you know, I, I come to the point that I'm completely aware of everything, and then it takes me an hour to fall back to sleep again. Yeah. So I've said this before. I um, sleep eat. Excuse me. I will literally, I wake up at the table. Or the worst is um, for a while I was obsessed with Reese's Cups, so I'd go buy a bunch of them. One time I woke up, you know, I, I took a whiz. I'm walking back, and I was like, what? There was a Reese's package stuck to the back of my neck because I was eating it because I was sleep eating. Yep. I, yeah, suppose, that's actually not that uncommon. I was going to ask you if you had episodes of sleepwalking. It's it's the most neurotic, but you know what? I um I knew um a, a well, she's, she's passed, but... I had a friend who was a tornado of a human being, but she um, would sleep drive and she got a DUI to the point where the cops like made her go prove that she had um, is sleeping issues. And she did, but she would get in her car and go driving. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm lucky that I sleep eat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I haven't, I don't actually sleep eat. I've had a couple episodes of sleepwalking. But it's like the cold blast when I open the refrigerator will wake me up. So I don't actually get the food out yet. Mage Grey Wolf said my mom washed the dishes in her sleep once. I wish I would do something constructive, constructive while I was like in my you know, sleepwalk. I go straight to the fridge. It's because I smoke pot. Yeah. So I'm hungry, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, that'd be great if you could be doing your, you know, your household chores while you're sleeping. When I was a kid, some of the best advice I got from my mom, she was like, hey, bro, if you're going to stay up all night, do something useful. And I took her up on her challenge and I started doing laundry and stuff. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I have this really neurotic habit where if I stay up really late, like, because I'm super ADD, so I'll have like four things going at once. Well, ADHD people like me, um, we have like our biological clock kind of goes like this in which like most people would want to be in bed by 10 and asleep. I'm not till two o'clock. So like my body is just now starting to come down. Yep. Same. Uh, Same. I'm here. What, what is proprioception? Yeah, it's. So I know about lucid dreaming because my dreams are so intense. I wake up and I have to remind myself that I wasn't where I just was like in my dreams. I'm like, okay, I'm in my room. Like I have to remind myself where I am because I have full yeah. conversations. I had a dream one recently that I was streaming with somebody that I don't necessarily talk to anymore. And I said out loud, what am I doing here? <laughs> Total anxiety dream. So, Total like funny dream. <laughs> so yeah. Jer, Jer experiences every movement of her body while she sleeps. That is crazy. Oh wow. The weirdest part, okay, about the whole like heart surgery is not not the brain fog or anything like that, but the fact that you're under for see, I was under for 10 hours. That's not sleep. You are in a completely altered state of state of consciousness or lack of consciousness, but it's not sleep. Your body doesn't consider that restorative or anything like that. It's not sleep. <laughs> I told you, I probably told you the story a million times, but I technically. But here's the thing though, for oh, like sorry. five or six days afterwards, I was sleep completely sleep deprived and I was hallucinating. Ooh. And I would have night terrors. I would wake up and I would see blood coming down the walls. I would see, you know, just weird shit going on. Um, I would be walking to the bathroom um, or trying to get out of bed and like things would transform in front of me, like the towel on the rack 
would turn and sh shake shift into like demons and stuff and my mind was just fucked at that point you have one hell of an imagination <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome. Uh, my yeah. greatest fear after I deconverted was is is I would have regularly have the event horizon hell scene play in my head. Um, sweet, that is literally on the stack of movies over here that I'm watching on VHS over and over. <laughs> I love that movie. I but absolutely. I've seen the director's cut three minute version of the hell scene. Okay, so when I when that movie came out, I remember sitting in the theater and being like, "Fuck, hell's in another dimension." That movie, gen I was I was uh, of a younger age. That movie genuinely scared me when I saw it when I was a kid. Yeah, it that, genuinely that scared me. fucked with my head clear into my thirties when I thought that's what hell was. Yeah, it's it's well, a good one to scare to scare you. Yeah. That's a good one. What, what, what movie is this? Event Horizon. And it's a great sci-fi movie back when they cared about when the ships looked like. It's yeah. just a great movie. The set, everything. It's it, you, You're there. It's it's a great movie. Lawrence Fishburne, Sam Neill. Um, who else is in that one? Oh, um, um, Captain Lorca, the guy who was in... Um, in the Patriot, he was the British Hessian guy. Okay. Oh, what is his name? Jason Isaac? Okay. Is that his name? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's, isn't he the pilot? He's a doctor. Oh, he's the doctor. Okay. Um, oh, and there's who's the girl. Who's the girl with the curly hair? Oh, I have to look it up now. I, 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 um, it's like one of my stoner movies I have on in the background when I'm alone on the weekends. You know, I watch it to defeat my fear. <laughs> Because I was so scared of it as a kid. I watch it as an adult now, and I'm like, I'm not scared of you. You're just a movie. <laughs> I watched Dune to get my fear. Because it has, the greatest, it has the greatest quotes about dealing with fear. That is such a good movie. I, I, get, I get scared by The Wizard of Oz, so. Yeah. <laughs> I got scared uh, and scarred by the, the sequel to Wizard of Oz. When I was young, is that when she goes back and everything's like everything is destroyed and yes, the, and the Goblin King or whatever is in the mountain and sweet, you sent me on a fucked up. I have to find that movie. I loved that movie. Have you ever it's, seen? It's, um, but the you Wiz? should not be four years old. Scene. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the Hellraiser. Still to this day, I look at my mom and I'm like. Why did you let me watch that when I was a Hellraiser scared me? Yeah. Now I laugh. It's a cheesy movie. You know? Well, Hellraiser is actually a really interesting movie from a philosophical perspective, but it's a terrible one to watch when you're four <laughs> or a kid. Oh, it scared the <laughs> that movie scarred me. Well, the um, sexual overtones of it of of mixing pain and pleasure together should make it like yeah, kids shouldn't be watching that. My parents drank, and as the as the you know the night went on, they got more lax because <laughs> they were super strict. And then they'd be like, "All right, sit yeah, over there." Their uh, their ingaff <laughs> levels would drop. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Especially with and honestly, like back in the day, a lot of the societal pressure was performative. So my parents were different out in public than they were at home because they they were like their rule was like, "Don't embarrass me. Don't get the cops called." You know. It was all, you know, much more performative. <laughs> Good times. And because I was making my MC Hammer pants, I had for inspiration. This is the original MC Hammer um, disc that I bought at Target. Please, Hammer, don't hurt A <laughs> hundred years ago. Because Target would sell the CDs that didn't have curse words. I had that cassette, <laughs> bitch. <laughs> My uh, my dad was always into technology, so we had like um, CD players when they were huge. Oh, when yeah, they I, were, I huge. had one of those too. But it was uh, I. My first CD was Weird Al Yankovic's, um, the the one with Jurassic Park on the front. Ah. <laughs> awesome. I bought um, where, where well, he did MacArthur Park into Jurassic Park. <laughs> 
I'm trying to think because I bought a bunch of vinyl as a kid, but my first like tape or CD, like I was obsessed with, uh, I can't believe I'm admitting this. I bought Da Brat, Functified, and Nine Inch Nails because I'm eclectic. <laughs> and I still have both albums. And Functified is an awesome album. <laughs> yes, Catnip, that is exactly what I have. And it, it's, A, it's fucked up because it fucks everything up for people who like have to work on like New York time and you don't live in New York. Huh. Uh, number one. Number two... It's fucked up because at two in the morning it's very quiet and quiet is not good for me because tick 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 every once in a while you'll see me start tweeting about three o'clock in the morning and all i can type is tick <laughs> tick tick i've seen that i didn't understand what it was <laughs> and sure i just read what answer said well i'm trying to keep it alive because it um a while ago, here in Southern California, I like oldies, like Frankie Valley, like oldies, oldies, and I know Jenny's gonna trash me, but then they played Nirvana. I'm on the freeway and I'm like, this isn't an effing oldie. I'm like screaming and driving down the highway. <laughs> it's 30 years old, man. It's oldies. Well, I, I did want to comment on the, the delayed sleep phase disorder, you know, and that's definitely one of my problems too, that I normally don't start getting tired until 2 or 3 a.m. And that's one of the things I'm hopeful on, that the sleep psychologist is the, the first sleep expert I've ever spoken with who acknowledged that some people are hardwired to be awake at night. Everyone else always had the idea that we're going to fix this. You'll be waking up at 7 a.m. Everything will be fine. Yeah. You know, and I... there's no fucking way that's ever going to happen for me. So we're, have, we're trying to work this to get me on a schedule that I'll be in bed at 2 a.m. and be up at 10. Yeah. And most delayed sleep phase people are around the 1.30 to 2.30 is when they their body starts being like, all right, time to sleep. Yeah. Well, well, and she's saying that's for people with ADHD. But um, I also, when I was in a, a group for adult, adults with autism, the uh, – the psychologist running that group told me that, yeah, 85% of the people on the autistic spectrum have some type of sleep disorder. That it's makes just sense. part of the package. What, um, what are your sleeping habits though? Like I'm, I'm on, um, like, uh, poppy, Papua New Guinea time and I'm okay with it. <laughs> like there's like, there's just certain hours I've adjusted my, my body to a certain time. <laughs> Well, the, the thing with ADHD and delayed sleep phase is when you're like after 10 o'clock, like my wife will go to bed and after 10 o'clock, the house is empty. It's it, well, it's not empty, but everybody's asleep. It's mm -hmm. very quiet. I can come down here to my office in the basement and I can work undisturbed for four straight hours if I have a project I'm working on. And since everything, and since I can't do anything that's loud or anything, it really mm -hmm. cuts my options down on what I can and can't do. And so I'm either forced to sit here and listen to quietly to the radio or some YouTube videos, but I'm always able to do like six or seven different things on my computer because I have mm -hmm. three computers and two monitors. And um, but you know, it they they say ADHD people just love the ten to two o'clock in the morning range because everything's clean everything's i do yeah um i i've always said that my most productive time was like midnight to sunrise and that's primarily because there aren't other people interrupting me i can yeah. stay focused on something native native atheist just said bourbon helps me sleep so yeah. i i quit drinking um almost six or seven years ago and it I won't even lie. I think one of the reasons I had normal sleeping habits is because I would pass out. Yeah. That's well, I was going to say that. <laughs> exactly. Because without alcohol, I do not. And it's been years. Like, I haven't had a sip or a drop in six or seven years, and I can't sleep. Yeah. Well, for me, that's kind of the, you know, the last ditch effort that when I'm getting to the point that I've already been 50, 60 hours and I'm not falling asleep, that drinking till I pass out could be the closest I'll get. And I know it's not a good thing to do, but it's like you get to that point, you do the only thing that you know works. 
And the sad part is, is it's not sleep either. No, it's really crappy sleep, but, you know, it's better than nothing. Yeah. Yeah, you, your brain does not get rested when you do that. And now that they're doing a bunch of research on sleeping habits, they're finding that people that sleep less than five hours every night are extreme risk for dementia, Alzheimer's. Because oh, oh, great. <laughs> what about the, the well, yeah. and it, the reason is, is because there's plaque buildup in your brain. Understandable. My, um, I watched my grandmother pass from Alzheimer's and I wouldn't, I'm vindictive and I wouldn't wish it upon my worst enemy. Well, and it's hard for the yeah. family too, because you lose them twice. Yeah, exactly. My grandma, she, she was the yeah. sweetest, kindest person on earth. And then she taught me curse words and she got really racist and it was laughable because she was this 98 year old lady trying to be racist. Well, yeah, they tend to lose your filters that way. <laughs> yeah, And that, that is the went... one thing that really scares me. It's, you know, like dying generally doesn't scare me, but the idea of mentally losing touch with reality. Yeah. I, I can't stand the idea of that. It's 50, 50 in my family because, um, the and then it's a statistic, but all the the black males in my family have died of heart attack before they go senile. <laughs> so it's well, it's, it's also sad. why I why I have to worry about using the alcohol too much is that uh, I actually have no idea what a natural life expectancy on my father's side of the family is, yep. because by the time they reach the age I am now. More than half of them were dead either because of alcohol or an accident involving alcohol. Same with my family as well. My um, dad's dad was a porter in Georgia in like 1940s and 50s Georgia, and he drank himself to death and had a heart attack. My my father was a legend, but he died of a heart attack at 80 years old on two days after his 80th birthday. So it's it's one of those things. I had another uncle that died of a heart attack and same bloodline. Yeah. Well, my mom's side of the family, you know, most of them lived into their 90s. And my mom's 90, 93 or 94 now. So is that is going. that the women or is that the men? Because in my family, the women lived to be almost 100, and the men, you're lucky well, if you I, made it to 70. <laughs> on my mom's side, for the most part, it's both. You know, both mm. of her parents and three of her grandparents. You know, so, um, and everybody's always said that more than anything, I take after my mom's dad, except that I'm half a foot taller, which they blame on him not having good nutrition as a child. So it's like... Okay, if they all live to their 90s anyway, and I got a better start than any of them, I think that gives me a better than average chance of beating 100. So your your head and shoulders are taller than everybody in your family? No, not everybody. You know, okay. it's just my, my grandfather. Okay. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just a tad under 5'9", so I'm just average okay. height. Uh, one of my family, brothers is like 6'4". One of the leading ways that you detect Marfan is people that are completely abnormal as far as their height is concerned based on genetics. Really? No, height so, weight, I fall into the normal range for an American male. My, my, well, no, my parents are both 5'10". I'm 6'5". <laughs> my like, cousin's like that. My both of both my aunt and uncle are both 5'5". Five, five. My cousin's 6'3". And you're taller than your both your parents by a wide margin, and by wide I mean like five or six inches. You should get screened. How tall well, that, is your dad, Ancher? Sorry, Ancher said she towers over her dad, and she's five two. So. Well, you did just describe one of my brothers. Like I say, we're all around, you know, five seven to five nine. He's like six four and skinny as a rail. And Marfan affects about seventy five to a hundred thousand people in the United States. I'm gonna call oh. my cousin right now. <laughs> I should drop him a note about that. That that's something he should probably talk to his doctor about. And if it's not Marfan, then it's probably one of the other connective tissue disorders. But those are a lot less uh, problematic. 
I um, I'm like yeah, having a conversation. The other part of it is is usually your wingspan with Marfan gets like taller than your height. So if you're six five, your wingspan will be like seven foot one. Mine was the exact opposite, which is why they didn't diagnose me when I was um, in high school. Uh, my my wingspan's only five ten, mm. which is I, the height that I should have been. Yeah. I don't think he has that. I think his you know, his span is probably about even to his height. Which is what it's supposed to be. Yeah. Well, I'm sure glad I'm normal. <laughs> you know, oh, Danny, no. you're probably no. the most normal one here. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. If you're normal, you've got to go. I can't have anybody normal hanging around with okay. me. It might be contagious. <laughs> but I... Um, Mm, but uh, um, uh, I get ingrown toenails. <laughs> I I tried normal yeah, ones. I I saw your hideous feet on the in the uh, DMs the other day. There aren't those gorgeous. No, <laughs> they're hideous and repulsive. Yeah, they are. I want them so bad. Do you, uh, there was the uh, chat chat folks. There was a picture going around of um. It, it doesn't look like it's homemade. It looks like it's a product. Of, and somebody made these really gnarly, gross, horrible-looking feet with these long toes. And, and Yeah, I'll have to see if I can find the post to show people. Not so much. Oh, no, 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 no. Have you seen the hairy leggings? Have you seen the hairy leggings? I knew a woman that had hairy leggings, and it was not funny because she'd wear them in public. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've heard about the gorilla leggings. <laughs> oh yeah. Let me finish about these these feet. They're you know it's 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 like a prop. It's a, it's a gag. But what they did instead of just having feet that just slip on your foot, it's a high heel shoe. <laughs> so okay, get, okay, like, I I found it. I'm going oh, to share okay, it. Great. Show uh, us. This is this is a warning to people. You know, um, sensitive people may want to um cover your eyes for a little bit here. Um, I want to find a place where I can buy these. Okay, here we are. <laughs> yeah, the, these are apparently some high heel shoes that somebody is making. Oh, jeez, I'm so creepy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, people uh, yeah. pay money for that stuff. Well, and and especially you know that that orange yellow toenails that just yeah. look like they're carrying some kind of infection. Fungus. Fungus. That's what fungus does to nails. <laughs> yeah. I think those would be so cool. <laughs> I can think of a bunch of different parties I'd love to wear those to. <laughs> oh, God. Even knowing that they're just like latex, they just still make me want to puke. <sighs> well, I'll give you a heads up if I ever get a pair and we go somewhere together. Yeah, if we go somewhere together with those, as soon as you get out of the car, I'm driving away. <laughs> uh, You've never seen my feet before. I have salmon snatchers. Those are <laughs> those are pretty compared to mine. Salmon snatchers. I'm like an eagle. Salmon snatchers, <laughs> though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and the sad thing is, I don't my my toenails literally grow over my toe, so I can ignore it and like I don't even feel it because I don't get hey, ingrown Randolph. hairs. So I don't get ingrown hairs. It's gross. I have a problem with one of my thumbnails because it got you know damaged in a drill accident many years ago. So the nail actually grows in a dome and just keeps curling down. It oh, just wow. it, it looks real weird, and for some reason, it's made that nail grow extra tough and like twice as thick. So it's like normal nail clippers can't even handle it. So, so perp, you've you've had a drill accident. You've had you've cut off a a, a bunch, bunch of fingertips on a on a table. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you make me like maybe grab should, my hand. Maybe you should stop fucking around with tools. You know? Hey. <laughs> You, you, okay, you, you have to consider my age, oh. you know, and yeah, I've had, you know, at least a half dozen accidents with power tools, but 
that only averages out to about one a decade. And until I was in my mid-40s, I was the only male member of my family who would never need stitches from a power tool. <laughs> no, I'm laughing you know? because after, <clears throat> after my fourth um, motorcycle accident, I'll never forget, my dad grabbed me and he's like, you're a shitty biker, get a new habit. <laughs> I, <laughs> and he okay. wasn't lying. He I do have lying. to admit that... <laughs> The achievement of oh. never having had stitches from power tools was kind of a technicality. Oh. Because when I hit my thumb with the table saw, the doctor um, sealed it up with super glue because he said there wasn't enough skin to stitch anything. Oh. oh. That one grew back okay. normally, though. That well, side's fine. Here, 40, 40 years of, of tools, they all work. <laughs> and they're all I normal say, like, I nowadays they that. have uh, the uh, the electric uh, charge detector in them where if you touch them even if they're going at full speed oh isn't that it's... something well yeah but that's really only on the more expensive table saws you don't find that on the stuff you could buy at home depot i i have a, <laughs> i have a big problem watching people use table saws uh because they're just so dangerous and, and radial arm saws and Anything with an open blade like that is just is, is so, interesting to me, and uh, I, I can't just can't watch people <laughs> play. Don't worry about that. I, I don't make those mistakes because I'm well, but, Okay, the one where I got the three fingers truncated, I don't that saw for more than 20 years. It was the only time I had all the guards and guides in place. And even the doctor at the ER said it probably wouldn't have been as bad if I didn't have the blade guard on. Because then my hand probably would have bounced off instead of being trapped between the guard and the blade. I don't yeah, buy one that. time I worked at a lumber yard in college and I was uh, uh, chopping down for uh, steaks, you know, the, the really warped shit that, you know, starts to form up in the old lumber yard. And I accidentally pushed the, uh, the stud that was warped with the direction of the saw. So saws turning like this, going like this, oh, and it oh, caught oh. that thing. And I have never seen a one by one because I was cutting them in half that was ninety two and five eighths long. Oh yeah, fly! Oh, yeah. <laughs> it had to be like two three hundred oh, feet you in the air. He's ripping is very dangerous. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I, I've what, seen what a table you? saw throw a chunk of two by four right through the plaster wall. It's horror movie dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I was just you know that stupid that I was actually cutting with the direction of the blade rather than against it, which is what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that amazes me is how much a board can warp. Okay. Good night, Doc. I actually have a um, giant scar on my face because I was trying to be Chuck Norris. I was cutting a two by two by eight, a piece of oak. It's it's like that. It's thick. I was using a Ryobi um, um, cordless um, saw, which if anyone knows, I was being lazy. <laughs> it cut through half of it. I put it up against my truck and I'm like, Oh, I'm smart. I'm going to karate kick this thing in half. Oh. I kicked it. <laughs> it came up. It hit me right here in my face. I have a... Cause you can't see it because I'm brown. I have a gnarly scar right here on my face. The person I was working for, I went to her house. She was a dental hygienist. And you know, there are certain people, you know they're not squeamish. I walked in her house. My face was covered in blood. The woman who worked for her, passed out when I walked in. I didn't know she was one of those people who can't stand the sight of blood. And she put um, invisible stitches on my face, and she saved my face. I always thought that we could reduce the number of, of um, work, work, work site errors or home errors with, with in shops or even gardening or whatever if, if we would deny insurance cover based on the deny insurance coverage based on the stupidity of what they did. 
Oh, I did some Tim Allen tool time shit where I hurt myself. Oh, like, you have a board bad. sticking through your hand because you were ripping with the direction of the blade? Yep. You're SOL. Yeah. Pay for that yeah. yourself. Oh, your kid, shot that, your kid shot that arrow through your shoulder blade? You're SOL. Get out of here. <laughs> if you're burned to a crisp because you were welding by a gas tank, yeah, well, you deserve that. That's Darwin has to got to get their piece of meat, you know. <laughs> I still laugh at that shot. That's an old shot of a guy calmly sitting in a waiting room with an arrow through his chest <laughs> and his son shot. <laughs> Every time I see it, it makes me die of laughter. <laughs> I, I do have to say, I do love the Darwin Awards. <laughs> yeah. I would, my, my favorite is the guy who trapped the Jato through the top of his car. And Jato stands for Jet Assisted Takeoff. Yes. Oh. <laughs> now, that, that is still one that the Darwin Awards still lists as being a legend. They were never able to find anything to confirm that. I don't so, care. The story is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> no joke. The, the one I like the, best was the only surviving person to get a Darwin Award. Who is? Was uh, a guy who was um, driving his pickup and the headlights went out. And he realized that a 22 cartridge was the same diameter as the fuse. Oh, so he put geez. that in to have the headlights to get home. And of course, being an electrical circuit, it heated up and shot him through the testicles. <laughs> Oh my god. So it it rendered him incapable of having children. He will not be in the gene pool anymore, but it didn't kill him. So he's the uh, only surviving person to get a Darwin Award. That uh, did him a thing. favor. We need to legislate so that anyone under 30, okay, uh, if you do a stupid thing and hurt yourself but survive, you get that you, you get you get an, an um oreotomy. <laughs> <laughs> That means you castrated, um, oh. you know, because because Darwin needs to have their pound of flesh, and if we if we keep you know letting people have kids, we're yeah. just promoting this. Well, no, see, it's not just letting people have kids. The reason our species is messed up is because the natural order of it would be that during adolescence, half of the males would get themselves killed off trying to show off, trying to impress everybody. And the species doesn't care as long as one male survives for every seven to ten females, the species carries on just fine. Very true. So well, our problem is that we're letting too many of the teenagers survive while they're doing stupid things. Well, that's my point. <laughs> Since we're you know, like, I am so glad we survive, have we have to smart keep phones. from having kids. <laughs> oh, so, self-indictment. Yeah. Like, I'm so against self indictments, and I would have been in prison if we had cell phones when I was in high school. I'm I, anti telling on myself. Yeah, I was saying that. I was saying that in the side chat in Neil's stream that I feel kind of sorry for the younger generation because when they're 40, their kids are going to come back with all the things in YouTube bookmarked in their tablets of all the things their parents did as teenagers. You know, it's all going to be recorded. It's all, you know, they would threaten us when I was in school about that's going on your permanent record. You know, until we got old enough to realize there was no such thing as a permanent <laughs> record. But yeah. now there is. Now there's a permanent record. It's called the Internet. It's yeah. on there forever. Yep. If the fascists ever take over, I'm going to be one of the first ones on the block because I promote socialism on my YouTube channel. Same. Actually, I might not be the first one on the block. The first ones on the block are the original revolutionaries who need to be cleared out because all of a sudden the guys that got power don't want to share it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so they have to clear their own out before they start clearing everybody else out. Every revolution eats their own. Yep. It's quite yeah. literally the third thing they do. They fight, win, and then they clear out the opposition after that. You know? And what X is saying here... Purge. <laughs> what X is saying here, this is tip number one. If you're going to commit a crime, do not take your cell phone with you. There was actually, a kid. No, Is actually, that the pay ideal somebody thing, else to have your cell phone and go somewhere else. Right. That's why I was going to say, if you're going to commit a crime, leave your cell phone in somebody else's car. So it's triangulated to a completely different location from where you're at. Well, you know, all these all these people on uh, January 6th who got busted, you know, yeah, a lot of them were identified through the Internet because the, the, 
cameras took pictures of them and they put it out in the social media and people say, oh yeah, that's so-and-so from such and such place. <laughs> and to verify all the, all, all the FBI has to do then is go back in your phone records for this yep. person and check their GPS. <laughs> that, Dummies. That is Dummies. Historically. And bingo, you're, you're caught. If you're yeah. going to go to a riot, don't bring your cell phone. <laughs> well, learn the concept of a burner phone. For 20 bucks, you can get a phone with no contract that you can use for the event and throw away the next day. So as someone who's been in several riots, as someone who's actually been in several riots in LA, Seattle, and Portland, you don't bring anything. You don't bring your ID. You, you bring your bad shoes. You you prepare to go to jail that day, you know, just in case you get hurted, you know, when they arrest, they do their token arrests, you know. Don't bring anything that's identifiable. You say your name is John Doe. <laughs> if yep. you're gonna buy, if you're gonna buy a burner phone, the most important thing is pay cash. Yeah. <laughs> cash. You know, that's preferably cash that has some residue on it, because you want to be able to, uh, you know, have the the lack of fingerprints that uh, cocaine residue has for uh, dollar bills. Yeah. And if you laugh at that, most got most American currency, hard currency, has cocaine on it. And um, the UK too. I I recently saw a statistic. They actually do more co cocaine than we do. So good for you, UK, because I know you're watching because you're up right now. <laughs> you know that's actually one of the problems I have with police officers is if I don't have a picture ID with me. They think I'm giving them a fake name because my real name is so bloody generic. <laughs> well, with my record, like, they would look at me and be like, okay, no one would lie with that. With that kind of yeah, well, my real name tapes up about six pages in the Minneapolis phone book. Oh, wow. So you're like oh, wow. John Smith? Pretty close to it, yeah. That's like um, being Jose Martinez or Hernandez out here. That's like, or if your name's Muhammad, that's like literally every other person out here, yep. you know? <laughs> so it's like I give them my name and they're like, uh, yeah, sure. And if I don't have an ID to pull out to prove it, they're not, you know, they're going to think I'm bullshitting them. Is that Muhammad with an O or Muhammad with a U? That's like, is that a prophet with an H? <laughs> yeah. I, I actually um, grew up with someone who was hardcore Roman Catholic, was in my catechism classes with me, and his name was Muhammad. <laughs> and he's um, somebody like that I would call if I had a problem. <laughs> if I needed help, I would call him be like, I need help, you know. It's one of those things. It's I don't think Muhammad is necessary. Is it, is it a cultural thing? Like, it's not... Yeah, I know. Um, I, I know. Black Eastern culture is still uses the name Muhammad, whether or not they're Muslim. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. I know a lot of African American There's people that are named Coptic Jose. Christians that have the name Muhammad. Exactly, it's one of those things. Like I know a lot of black people named Jose, and both of their parents um, are African American. Guy that played for the University of Nebraska, Abdul Muhammad, was a Catholic. Yeah. Exactly. Well, <laughs> I, I did put a lot of thought into it to pick a more unique name that I'll be changing to. So, I thought my last name was um, was rare, and then I and then I got into genealogy and found out that I'm related to every other um, African American person on the East Coast, <laughs> and my name is not as rare as I thought it was. It's just rare on the West Coast. Well, I picked Tarragon to go go by for a new name and found out, you know, it, it's actually a Dutch word that means little dragon. Oh, that's awesome. So because I was with that, then I figured I might as well make it match. So I picked a Dutch word for a last name. I thought it, I thought it was um, um, like Italian for savory herb. <laughs> Never mind. That's well, like actually, the word. No, actually, that's where the herb got its name because well, the, the slang for the herb had been called the dragon weed. So, in African culture, Achille means warrior, and in certain um, European languages, Achille means flower. <laughs> and it's just you know, it depends on where you're from. It's so you're the flower warrior. <laughs> it reminds I, I, me of a busted quarterback named Achille Smith. 
Um, I am related to somebody. Well, I'm not anymore because my sister got a divorce from that person that actually had that name, same name, that played football for the Raiders back in the day. Same guy, yeah. He drafted yeah. by the Bengals, uh, floated around the league for a while, and uh, it wasn't it, it wasn't Achilles Smith because he would have way more money and actually pay my child, my sister, child support. <laughs> My, my You're forgetting a, that every NFL person pretty much is broke two years after they leave the league. So the statistic is um, he played three years, which is the NFL, like, you're lucky if you play three years. Yeah. And um, people he, wash out in two. He met my sister when he was 30. He was aged out by the time he was 30. He's 50-something now, complete CTE, complete, like, Six seven scary psycho guy who lives in Northern California. The football did not do him any favors. He had his entire life handed to him, and then when it was taken away, he was like, "Why aren't you guys still clapping for me?" You know, it was it was not it was ugly to watch. Here's, here's the <laughs> fucked up part of the NFL and how the their medical and their retirement system works. You have to play for five years to be vested. They're just now they're going to start settling with people like they proved that he had CTE. So they're basically paying him to not sue the NFL. <laughs> they're yeah, basically they're, yeah, like they're going to be settling <laughs> civil suits pretty pretty regularly now, but the fact that they're they set up a cliff vesting system where you have to be in the league for 5 straight years. Yeah. Oh yeah. Knowing that I'm, I'm, I think something like half the players wash out in the first four years. Oh yeah. yeah. At least. I can't, I can't understand how, you know, you made the comment earlier about NFL players going broke and stuff with, with some of their intense salaries. I don't understand how uh, all these lottery winners you hear about who, you know, win 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars and lose it all within five years. Okay. I so. I can see that. I oh, like I fucking stupid can you be? <laughs> I talk about this all the time. COVID did me such a favor. It's not even funny because I stopped going to Vegas on the weekends. I was a real compulsive gambler. They still send me like they're like, hey, sewing, we miss you. Here's a month free. You can stay at the Venetian. Like they miss me. But I would win a lot, but ask me how much I lost. You know, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was going for years and years and, you know, I can afford to, to throw some money down. I, I, I've saved so much money sitting at home the past two, two years. It's not even funny because I'm not going to Vegas every weekend. You know, well, that's, that's a good thing. Stick with it. The, oh, I, the, I'm, I'm over it. The lottery winners also uh, get very risky in their investments and they also become targets for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. and... Well, I, I've already talked to a friend of mine who's um, an investment lawyer and she sets up foundations and stuff like that uh, for a living in one of the big fancy law firms in Milwaukee. And, you know, so we have an agreement already that if I were to win the lottery, all I have to do is give her a phone call and she'll put everything in action to make sure I can't do that to myself. Um, okay, well, and so, quite honestly, a, a lot of them, you know, when they get the money, they try to help too many people. Yeah. They wind well, up giving a lot of it away, well, and a lot of times they wind up getting swindled by their own friends and family. It's See, usually that, family. That's my current plan is, if, is you know, if I'm just imagining I win I win uh, $200 million, which means you walk away with $100 million, that I figure even if my health is perfect, I'm not going to be around for more than 20 years. Maybe twenty five. Uh, so let's let's um, hang on to three quarters to a million dollars uh, per year for those that number of years. Mm -hmm. and everything else can go to charity or whatever I so choose. And I've decided I'm going. I will set up a fund and a foundation. I don't know how it'll be structured. Um, that will pay for the um, various surgeries and and treatment that trans gender people need that aren't that isn't covered by insurance for them so here's what you do you use what's called a charitable remainder trust so what you have it is you have it pre-set up then you go collect your lottery check and then you have it sent directly to the what's called a crat which is the charitable remainder trust <laughs> no taxes will be paid on it because it's a 50c3 
Mm -hmm. Now, what happens is charitable remainder trusts are a kind of life of the trustee type vehicle, which means you as the trustee would be receiving all the income off of it. When you die, everything underneath of it gets sent to the charities that you chose. It's irrevocable, so no one can con you out of it. That's, it. So, that's, so basically what you do is you set it up and you say, okay, the only thing you can do to say, say 200 million, so 130 million, you say, okay, you can only buy 10 year treasury bonds. That's it. It's all you can buy. And you send me the income off of that and we're good. That, that'll pay you, you know, two, two and a half percent. Yep. You and know, it's so really funny. On that, I, you're making $2 million a year. Okay. Well, that that's why you've never heard of a broke Rockefeller. My, because um, he put everything into irrevocable trust so that his descendants could only collect the interest and nobody could ever swindle them out of the principal. Yeah, the, think, the reason they're broke today is because it's been split so many times. Yeah. My... um. My mother and father put this really janky clause in the family trust where, like, if you basically prove that you can't handle your um, finances, you get a financial advisor. And yeah. I'm, like, the only one in my family that doesn't. And it's ironic because I'm the total delinquent, but I actually got a steady job and a career. Well, I, I heard that Britney Spears' <laughs> father is, is open for work. <laughs> you know what, though? Like, I'm going to tell you something. Um Britney Spears is actually really kind of sad because yeah, when you yeah. look when you look in her eyes, like she has that fifty one fifty stare where she's almost not home. Like she is being taken advantage of. Oh yeah, she's she's mentally disabled and people are taking advantage of that, and that's not okay. That's and, and I'm not saying that she's like can't take care of herself, but she, she needs uh, help. She well, needs yeah. Help. Real help. But she doesn't need help from somebody who's going to swindle her. Yeah, that's exactly. the problem. It's that the people who are currently handling her affairs are not doing it in her interest. And no one's going to come to someone like me who would actually have a standard of ethics and fiduciary duty and like let me handle it because we're not connected. I'm not connected to that world. You know, it's that actually happened with my grandmother. Um, my uncle was basically trying to spend all her money and my mom was the executor and he took my mom to court and lost, you know, because he, because the judge was like, are you kidding me? Like this paperwork shows that you're just trying to spend all the money, you dummy. And like, he, he got kicked out of court, you know, but you have to have when you're, when you're the executor of something like that, you have to be honest and have a paper trail, you know, that's the size of the phone book. Yeah. Oh, man, it is two o'clock. I am tired. I know. I you know, we, we talk about thing. Britney Spears. I just want to bring this up because it's on my mind now. Oh, uh, remember when she was having? She was at the peak of her troubles, and she was just the butt of every late night comics joke and and everything all over all over the world. It was it was just it was just terrible. It was so sick here. Our the local most, news. Sorry. The most honorable thing I've ever seen in in um, in entertainment anywhere at, at any time was uh, Craig Ferguson. Remember Craig Ferguson? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, he got up for his monologue one night and had a serious talk with with the audience and the camera about Britney Spears jokes and how inappropriate they are and and how wrong we are to to make fun of her that she's somebody who's in genuine pain and needs genuine help and and, and, it was, and, he, and he pledged to never do a, a Britney Spears joke again and he never did but it's you can actually find it on YouTube I think um, it's pinching it's, down it it's it's just it's so heartfelt it'll make you cry when you when you hear him deliver the speech he was he, I, I just think Craig Ferguson is one of the greatest human beings ever. ever. Um, he, he also did a couple soliloquies when his his parents died each separately. Um, you know, and, and just talked about the love of his parents and, and this kind of stuff. And it was 
it was just so touching. I, everybody needs to see it and get in touch with their own feelings about it. Yeah. Okay, well, I think this is probably a, a good time to kind of wrap things up because I'm losing my voice again. Hey, I, I just um, want to take a quick moment. Um, the, the fundraiser has gained a, a little bit more, uh, nothing, nothing spectacular. But I've begun to talk with the uh, guy with the car. It is still available. And um, he, we're working on some negotiations on price. And thing, things are progressing slowly, but uh, we may have good news uh, over okay. the weekend. I'm actually surprised it's still available at that price. I thought somebody else would have snapped it up. Well, fortunately, there's all those assholes on places like Facebook and online dealing who say, oh, yeah, I'm coming and I'll go pick that up and then never show up. And ah. mm -hmm. so he's been burned by several people already. And Right. Um, oh, I yeah. saw stuff online. People kick the tires. They lie or. Well, but, you know, like I was telling people that yeah, I've just got a little Ford Focus hatchback. But, you know, I paid 1500 for it, but I had to have the front suspension rebuilt before I could take it on the highway. So it wound up costing me $3,000 before I had a highway-ready car there. This guy is, is, is highly um, um, questioning of me, just like any other, um, or was questioning of me, just like any other internet uh, scumball that comes along, until uh -huh. he and I realized that we have several mutual friends. Uh -huh in the car business. This guy's an actual professional tech, so the confidence in the car is way up. And yeah, well, that's the good thing that, you know, you're plugged into a community there that, you and, know, and that at least... I, I contacted my mutual friends and he contacted the same people yeah. to, check, to, to check me out and we all... So he's heard of your reputation. ...is above boards and, and, and um, in fact, one of my friends was going to try and buy the car himself. So. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's starting to look good. We'll let you know what happens. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, I will drop Jenny's PayPal link in the side chat here. I, I know most everybody here who could has already contributed, but you know, people, if you can share the link on Twitter, Facebook or whatever, just, uh, you know, to get it out in front of it, some people who m might not have seen it yet. And, and again, folks, I, I, I come to you on my, my knees and, telling you how humbled I am by everybody's kindness and generosity. Yeah. It's it's not something one, one expects to actually happen. Well, and Jenny <laughs> needs a car. Where she lives, not having a car is not an option. She can't get to her doctor's appointments without one. Absolutely. I can't even get to the coffee shop. <laughs> yeah, you know, and uh, taxis or Uber are not an option in a small town. Yeah, although, the although I could be, I'm maybe not a thumb down a John Deere or something. I <laughs> <laughs> well, she she's usually uh, in La Crosse in the afternoons because that's where her, her doctors and hospital are. But uh, she actually lives in a, a small town in Minnesota that's like uh, an hour east of Rochester. Houston, Minnesota. The good Houston. Yeah, so it's a town of only 900 people and there's no such thing as mass transit. I mean, that's sections of the town probably don't have sidewalks. No. That's like I... I know a place uh, called Phoenix, Oregon. <laughs> you would literally drive past it because it's an <laughs> off ramp. <laughs> it's literally one off ramp on the five freeway. Yeah. Uh, we do have sidewalks. I just want you to understand we do have sidewalks. We have street lights. Oh, well, we do have a couple gravel roads downtown. Do you, but do, do you have a diner like Trempolo has, though? Uh, no, that went out of business. <laughs> yeah. Trimple, that Trempolo diner is great. Well, yeah, I, you can get a full English there. Mm -hmm. I was in a town of 3,000 people, and once you got more than about five blocks from the center of downtown, there weren't any sidewalks. <laughs> yeah, no, our whole town is about, um, you, know. uh, I, I, you can look at it on Google Earth and measure it. I think it's about yeah. a half the, a mile end to end. The, the real funny thing about where I was living was that you know, they had an RV park because tourism was basically the only thing that brought in money. But if oh, you were coming, have, in, if you were coming into town on the highway, you yeah. came to a sign that says RV Park Second Right. We also had some. But at the end of the 1980s, they had taken out one of the stoplights, so there was only one stoplight in town. So the hmm. second light would have been in the next town, 17 miles away. 
<laughs> well, they I never drive, took that sign down or corrected it. When I drive to Lacrosse, it is one left turn, one stoplight. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> which is which is not normal for that because normally you have to jog between thirty five and fifty three about sixteen different times. Yep. Oh no, that's all Wisconsin crap. This is the Minnesota is wide open on the on the roads because it's all. Oh, I know, crap. I know, but if you get into lacrosse, the the thirty five fifty three does this yeah. like fourteen yeah. different times, and it was that was for somebody who's like numerically dyslexic as as I am, and I can't even remember the word for that. <laughs> um, having t two highways that are parallel, 53 and 35, which then branch off in important ways, it was really yep. hard to remember which one. And <laughs> meanwhile, in Los Angeles, um, I get on the freeway by my house and there's eight lanes <laughs> just on one side of the freeway. Well, there, there's an interesting uh, little quirk of geography that a nice through strip is if you get on I-90 in Rochester, Minnesota, and stay on it for 1,000 miles, you're in Rochester, New York. Oh, that's interesting. Wow. Well, we have we have roads around here that can only take one car at a time in our gravel. So <laughs> this eight lanes is kind of kind of a mystery, mystery to me. That's, how can they do that? <laughs> oh, we have so many people here. But L.A. is a complete trash hole. Stop sending your kids here, please. This is a PSA. We, we did have some exciting news here in town uh, th this last week. Um, we now seem to have uh, two coolers and three bears that have taken a permanent residency in the area. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> oh, man, yeah. I got a cougar. Yeah. I'm going to get a restraining order yeah. on her. Uh, where we were, by. there was a bear that came into town every night on the, you know, just before the morning when they collected the garbage. He came in for the garbage cans. And they tranquilized and relocated relocated that bear four times he kept coming back so they finally had to kill it oh, oh that's just awful well, i live it kept in hippie finding its way into town and it's like anybody who was out on the streets after dark was at risk of being attacked yeah the locals here just keep telling me oh well it's just it's just black bears don't worry about them i'm sorry anything that's like 400 500 pounds and has really big yeah. claws and teeth I really um, don't trust. They don't, and, I can't talk to them. You know. Have you seen those, any like, carnivore that outweighs me is something to avoid? Yeah. Have you seen this footage of when those when a bear just kind of leans against the, someone's front door and the door explodes? Like yep. bears are no yeah. joke. Bears yeah. are, and it happens here in California well, all the time. You know, and even ignore the size. If you've got a wild animal that is desperate enough to attack you, you're in trouble. I would not want to go one on one with a raccoon. There are bears that are smart enough to know how to operate a door handle on a car in a house. Oh, yeah. They figure window. it out. Our, mm -hmm. our raccoons are puppy size here. I'll fight. If I have my boots on, I'm fearless. Well, if I don't have my boots on, yeah. I'm running. <laughs> that's what I mean. You know, raccoons aren't that big, but they're vicious little assholes. Oh, they're huge. You know, I can't there was a... they will jump anything they think they have a chance of taking down. Call them by their scientific name, Trash Panda. <laughs> there was a raccoon that was stuck in a in a um in a trash container over at the ranch. We put a two by four for it to walk out. It starts gnawing on the two by four. Yep. Like those they're they're crazy. Well, raccoons and the other are... thing about raccoons is that they usually they travel in family units, but they spread out to forage. Mm -hmm. So when they charge you, they will scream. Okay, that's not an attack cry. They're not scared. That's calling in reinforcements. You have about 30 seconds before you've got five or six of them jumping you. Oh, my, there was one time um, my neighbor, she was this like 110 pound woman. And one day I see her standing outside of her garage. I'm taking her son to school. She's holding her child and she's like sitting there. And I'm like, hey, are you okay? And she's like, there's three raccoons in my garage and I can't get to my car. I said, what? I pulled over. I said, here, watch the kid. I went in there. I was like, I, I opened the garage and I, I grabbed a, um, a golf club. I challenged those mother effers. Like, <laughs> raccoons, are they're fearless. They're not scared of humans. They were not scared of me. They just kind of <laughs> gave me the finger and sauntered off because I was too much trouble. I, know, I um, believe like the last six these. months I was living in New York. The raccoons had gotten really bold that they were coming in the cat door 
and they were coming right into the kitchen to get the cat food. Oh, I yeah. had to chase them out of the house with a mop several times. Yeah, that's why I, like, you have a I like Native Atheists. Uh, <laughs> I like what Native Atheists said. We get um, the white and black ones around here. They you don't have the white ones around there. Those are polar bears. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. he's talking about bears. I was talking about um, trash pandas. <laughs> Anyway, I got to get going. I am calling. Okay. Through. Yeah. Well, sweet. You want to? Uh, uh yeah. Um, show your stream again. Twitch.tv with uh, slash Irish underscore Swede is my Twitch address. Uh, so original, I know. Uh, starting five p.m. tomorrow, I will is when the starting soon sign will come up. Hopefully, it uh, goes down sometime soon after that. I will be just chilling out and anybody that wants to pop on and say hi uh if you have the ability to donate please do if you don't share around and and maybe somebody else does uh trying for five thousand dollars this year and would be nice if we can get it it's a wonderful foundation and it is totally worth it awesome. well if you can send me a link on twitter um i'll share it around there and i'll put it i'll edit it into the description for the stream Yep, we'll do right now. Awesome. Okay, Jenny, you got anything going? Movie night? What's up? Well, we got we I believe we got movie night happening on uh, Friday um, at ten thirty Eastern. Yep. There's a little, there's a little debate right now. Jess is kind of thinking, well, maybe we should skip movie night and, and do a game thing uh, on a Sunday. Um, and that doesn't seem to be settled. But I'm assuming at this point yeah. that that movie night's still going to happen. Um, we got well, movies to go through. Yeah, um, part of the reason she was considering doing that is that it, um, yesterday was actually two years since Jeff died, so she wanted to do something to commemorate that. Oh, awesome! You know, side strike. Oh yeah, that guy. <laughs> It was actually one of the first channels that I watched um, three three years ago. It was one of the first channels that kind of threw me in the community. Wasn't he? Yeah, something? well, and it, if you want a good laugh, you go on there and uh, find his tour of the Ark Encounter with Sean. I've seen that. That is, is hilarious. You should go watch that. Everybody should go watch that. In other words, they made stuff up. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, just Sean's then, delivery in that is so good. Uh, and then on, on Sunday, I believe it is, B does their um, uh, their their show, and and he usually asks me to come on as as a guest. So I it's seven thirty nine. Uh, do you, you mean the Root and Branch show or? Yeah, what what? Yeah, the the Root and Branch usually does Monday evenings. Oh, is that Monday? Okay, I. I You're in a time warp. <laughs> yeah, so that's usually Monday evening at 7.30. I think my brain is failing, so... That's okay. <laughs> if I start drooling on camera, just let me know and I'll dry off. <laughs> ah, you're fine. Okay, Will, your spiel. Speaking of brain failure, I am Godless Sewing from the Godless Sewing channel. Come on down. You know what? Honestly, before I, I go off as usual, I humbly thank everyone that subscribed today because I got thrown over 100. So thank you very much. I will continue to make crappy tutorials. I made hammer pants. When I'm done editing the video, it will be out eventually sometime between now and 4 o'clock in the morning West Coast time. So thank you. I will continue to make crummy videos and I'll show up every once in a while uh, here on the on uh, on your show, Purple. So thank you very much. Hey, what cool. sewing machine is that? This is my Husqvarna Viking Emerald 116. And I'm going to say that Husqvarna is one of the greatest sewing machines until they give me yep. like five of them. <laughs> I actually had one of those like, you know, 15 years ago. Um, I, I gave it to a friend when I moved, and I really regretted parting with it. This um, <laughs> this is actually a superior machine. And I, I get other machines because I don't want to beat this one up. But a Hasvarna, it's worth the money. It's worth spending money on it. It's a, it's, a, it's not orange. 
they actually have certain um, ones that are. This particular oh, yeah. year was really popular because I see um, a lot of, like, I watch endlessly watch sewing tutorials and all the cool kids have one of these but this is from from like 2018 2017 ish i saw some from husqvarna's i, I think it was ebay some sergers and they were getting 200 dollars and less are, are those any good or are those like a cheap knockoff version you know what you it's it's one of those things where you have to shop around and it's not always the brand because like Singer makes quality sewing machines and they're not they're not as expensive, you know. Mm -hmm. They're they're um, affordable. The one you can go you can go buy a dependable sewing machine right now at Walmart. You know, it's it's not always the brand. It, and there are certain brands which I won't name that are overpriced that are over ambitious and don't work from the jump. Yeah. Well, and the other thing with sewing machines is it's hard to compare because there's such a wide range of features and like, you know that um, you, you can get a really solid machine that's less expensive because it just has fewer stitches or you can yeah. get a really expensive machine that's not very good just because it has 35 program stitches exactly that's why i freaked out when i bought that one last week and made a video the day i bought it because it's a solid steel sewing machine when i was making my hammer pants i put it under that thing that thing went through the elastic both sides with no problem and it's older than i am and it still um works you know so it's not always sorry see a that? Krager sticker on a sewing machine it's not what you see every day <laughs> oh I yeah. have um, real SDP um, <laughs> Racing Fuel Incorporated stickers here. I have a bunch of Gearhead stickers. <laughs> I knew you would recognize that. I knew you would recognize that. That's actually um, a Bel Air sewing machine from 1959. It looks like a Starship. I, I probably won't put stickers on that one. It's too beautiful. Mm. All right, I'll okay. I'll stop talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me close this out here. That uh, get back. Where was I? <clears throat> so, um, well, first of all, again, for anybody who missed it earlier, uh, this show's going to start moving two hours earlier. So we're going to be starting at 10 p.m. on Thursdays, um, just because we're attempting to get me into a normal sleep schedule. Um, as far as me, I'll, I'll be on, on movie night, which is, uh, what, in about 20 hours from now. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and then I'll, I'll be on the shills Saturday evening. Um, I think that's, they keep moving the time now, so I'm not sure if they're starting at six or at eight central time. So, and of course, I need to thank all my patron supporters, X of the Utah Outcast, Junie the Apostate, Robert X, Ox, Von Rick, the Lavender Lady, and Greg Hartwick. And especially Greg Hartwick, he has been my, my uh, longest and most loyal supporter and, you know, has helped out with a lot of things and he, he is somebody who I think has donated to like every charity thing that we've run. Absolutely. Great so, is yeah, awesome. he, you know, he's always there trying to help everybody out. Well, I just hope he doesn't hurt himself in the process. Because <laughs> I've seen his name everywhere. He really is a, a, a kind and generous person. Absolutely. And he tags me with the greatest stuff on Twitter. <laughs> Um, Matter of fact, Greg Hardwig um, with the gay pants preacher is what inspired me making the hammer pants because I'm all about gay pants. I okay, can't you're not say gay I'm not sure what you mean by a tuck. <clears throat> uh, you don't know tuck? Well, I know it as a sewing term, but I'm not sure what he was meaning it as there. Where I'm, where I'm from, if you ask um, an individual if they're tucked, you are... Um, really close to that person <laughs> <laughs> yes 
Uh, I think but, there was a movie about that. <laughs> I think I know. Let's just let's just say it's not something I have to do any longer. <laughs> Matter of fact, that's a, that's something I haven't heard in a long since my Hollywood days before it got gentrified and ruined. <laughs> that movie is based in my state. Oh wow! What's it called? Okay, The Crying Game. Oh oh oh, oh. yes. Yeah, I, I have that, that one. On v I have that on VHS. <laughs> I I still have never seen it. What? Uh, my from from what I've gathered in the way that I've educated myself, it's a terrible movie of, that that does not do the trans community any favors. No, it was it the it was the publicity at the time. It was it was like it was kind of like when what's his face said, "Frankly, dear, I don't give a damn." It was less about what was said and more about that everybody was talking about it, you know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, very... well, with that, we will bid you all good night. No, I'm not done. <laughs> well, I went through this, I went through this period for you know, a, a, a way too many years where I would avoid watching movies that I heard or knew had a content that even touched on transgender issues or or homosexual issues like because i was i was afraid that i would watch it and people would see me watching it and they would assume and figure out that i was a trans and and that you know all hell would break loose and stuff i kind of had the same experience i'll say it really quick before we end this stream um there's a movie called lifetime companion it's i don't know if it's an 80s or 90s movie but um I don't even know why my parents had it and they caught me watching. And you know what? For as hardcore as they were, they didn't say anything. But for the rest of my life, I was like, do they think I'm gay? Do they like they totally knew they totally, you know, they saw right through me. But I, I know what you're saying. And Lifetime well, Companion is a good movie. <laughs> well, you know, it, it really has made me like look at things again of all these Victorian era explorers who always said their gentleman companion with them at all times. Don't you know what? That that's a five hour subject because they were all gay. Yeah. Oh, bye. Well, all okay. of them. You know? Maybe we should get that in. <laughs> exactly. Maybe for the show next week, we should start out with that. We can I go off on that, oh, on that one. <laughs> I'll, come with okay. the, I'll come with the history books next week. <laughs> okay. Well, good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.